Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse show. Jess and I are just sitting here going, Charles, we love your comments about your dad. We would love to meet him someday in heaven, I hope. But c can you share a little bit more? You were in the middle before the break about how your father influenced you on your religious formation. Well, as I say, for starters, uh, you see, he was very, very much a believer that the parents are the primary educators of the children. <laughs> Good for him. I, well, I know it sounds it sounds obvious, except people don't get it. Yeah. And one of the big problems in my era was that uh, people figured you went to a Catholic school, the, the nuns, they take care of it. Well, they took care of it, all right, which is why most of us who went to Catholic schools aren't Catholic. That's a fact. Mm. They took care of it. Yep. You know, very nicely, if making non-Catholics is what you want to do. So, as I say, my father would review all of our school books, and especially the religion books, because, of course, this was the immediate era after the council, uh, and stuff, quite frankly, was going utterly mad. Yep. Uh, and it so happened, my first brush with this stuff was at, I don't want to be, you know, mention the names, but it was Blessed Sacrament Church in Hollywood, California. I love this. I know it's... Well, I don't want to. I, I don't want to be specific. That's okay. But it was the Immaculate Heart nuns. Sure. Um, yeah, and the, the the famous explosion in uh, Sapphic Rage. Yes. Uh, that we were part of it. Yeah. My brother and I, and um, you know, it was a very difficult time, but my father didn't lose his bearings, didn't lose the faith. One of the things in dealing with church matters, uh -huh. and this. This came from, frankly, from his background being French Canadian from New England. The community had had kind of a problem with the Irish hierarchy back in the twenties. The uh, the famous, uh, well, not famous to you, but to us, the Sontanelle affair. Uh, it came very close to a schism, like the Polish National Catholics. Wow! But fortunately, through the intervention of a uh, schismatic girl, uh, not schismatic. Gosh, my mind's going stigmatic. That's a different word. A uh, little rose ferron. Schismatic and stigmatic are two <laughs> different things, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, thank you. If, if someone's in schism, that's one thing. If they've got the stigmata, that's a different thing. They're not the same. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. And now, mind you, you may feel like it. If you've got, if, you, if you're <laughs> in schism, you might feel like you've got that. Anyway, let's yeah. move along. Okay. So the thing is, this little rose ferron kind of intervened, and uh, everybody respected her, so she was able to basically broker a deal. So that it didn't happen. But what did happen was that those who had been Sotinellists never really had the kind of adulation of the hierarchy that people associate with the pre-Vatican II church. Uh, and so my dad was always very clear on the distinction between the office and the man. Good distinction. Oh, yeah. It's all Critical. important. Critical. All important. Yep. Because if you don't make that distinction, two things happen. The uh, errors or faults or flaws or whatever the man mm -hmm. can destroy the appearance of the office to you. Well said. Mm. And contrary wise, mm -hmm. the the mere fact that the fellow occupies the office may lead you to think that he's as perfect as the office is. Well, no. I do know our medieval Catholic ancestors, and I'll deal specifically with the idea of monarchy here, the king, they had a very clear distinction here. They called the body political of the king, which is the king who never dies. You know, the king is David, long live the king. Yeah. And then there's the body natural, the particular king of the day. And that, although dad would not use those words, the idea of the body political and the body natural for any office, and especially for the church, was something that was very much a part of his thinking. So we knew some of the worst priests imaginable mm. in every way you can guess. But it didn't affect his uh, his love for the priesthood. Awesome. In fact, he used to say, if you could go to confession to a priest who, for other reasons, you despise, yeah, that's an act of humility. Hmm. I mean, your oh, your father had it, man. Wow. Well, wow. He did, because I, you know, it it there's the priest, the man. And the priest, the priest. And another, I remember one time he and I were walking behind Blessed Sacrament, mm -hmm. and the, the Jesuits there was filled with scotch bottles and all that. And Dad says, now here you go, son. Here's an important point to make. I said, what's that, Dad? <laughs> Is this a scandal or not? 
And I said, well, I don't know. Is it? And he said, it depends on the sermon you hear tomorrow. <laughs> he said, the sermon is good and orthodox and clear. Ah, oh, well, you know, Father likes a little tipple. <laughs> on the other hand, if it's heretical or stupid, worthless drunk. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Oh, God. And how old were you when that happened? What's up? How old were you when your father gave you that? Were you just a youngster? Eight or nine. Yeah, see that? Incredible. Well, Incredible. see, he had to because things were happening. Yeah. I mean, it was this, it was like with the nuns, you know, with the IHMs, and they dropped their habits. Yeah. Um, again, this is typical. In every one of our classes, uh, first grade through eighth grade, um, my brother being in eighth and I being in second. Yeah. Uh, he was getting ready to graduate. Yes. And in each class was sort of a plebiscite. The sister would stand there in her lay clothes yeah. and call your name, and you had to stand up and say yes or no. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you agreed, no, if you didn't. Now, we knew we were being used, and we knew what they wanted. Of course. So in my case, every class, uh, sorry, every, every person when they would stand up and say yes, yes, yes. It was alphabetical order. Mm -hmm. Then she got to Kulam, and I stood up and said no. Well, no one else had been asked to explain. So she says, well, Mr. Coulomb, won't you come up to the front of the class and explain to us all why you disagree? And I'm walking. I kept a, a yeah. poker face, but I'm thinking, sure. you know, I know she thinks she's doing well. We'll see. So I get up there to the front of the class, and I yeah. turn around. And I said, well, sister, a soldier has his uniform, a priest has his cassock, and a nun has her habit. And if she doesn't want to wear it, she shouldn't be a nun. Oh, you really said, how old were you when you said that? Eight. <laughs> but the thing is, Eight. Uh, well, uh, believe me, my parents, they had very sharp tugs, with the, which I grew up listening to when they had to deal with people. So. Yeah. so at any rate, I said this, but I hadn't shown any disrespect or anything. So all she could do was say, sit down. <laughs> and I did. Yeah. But then everybody said no after me. Wow. Because... You know, I hadn't been eaten alive. So, yeah. the, so the second grade was a wash. Yeah. In my brother's class, eighth grade, same, same. But he was stuck with the same deal, sent up to the front. Yeah. He said, well, sister, I just don't understand. If you don't have to obey the cardinal, why do we have to obey you? Oh, that's a great logic. Yes. And again, sit down. Everybody said, everybody said no after that. Mm -hmm. So the second grade and the eighth grade were total washes. Well, my dad got two very angry ladies calling him that evening. I imagine. Oh, they were very upset. Now, he and I hadn't discussed it at that oh. up to that point because he didn't think I'd be stuck with something as stupid. Yeah. So she tells him what happened. Yeah. And then says, what's wrong with your son, Mr. Coulomb? Why doesn't he want to be progressive? You know, I'm a second grader, huh? Unbelievable. Jeez. That's what we had to experience back in the 60s and 70s. Go ahead. And my father's response was, well, I don't know, sister. I, I guess he'd rather be right. <laughs> it didn't go over well, I imagine. Uh, so that that was kind of a loss. And what she didn't know, of course, was that he was doing everything he could to keep from laughing. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, Sister John Patrick, or Sister Donna, as she became, calls uh, my dad about Andre. Sure. Tells him the story. And... Dad says, well, I don't know, sister. He's asked a very good question, and I don't have an answer for him. You better, because I don't. <laughs> so the thing about my brother is that he's always had a wonderful skill, if, if wonderful is what I can call it. He can look at you. He won't make faces at you. Just look, and you want to smack him. You just want to <laughs> pop him. Yeah. Well, he started doing that after this event to her mm -hmm. all the time. Sure. She took about a week and a half of it, and she calls my dad. And says, Mr. Coulomb, I want to talk to you about Andre. And Dad said, well, what's going on? Is he, is he cutting up in class? No. Was he being disrespectful? No. Well, what's going on, sister? And he could hear her. He didn't know it up to this point what the story was. But she was like, well, he, 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 he looks at me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Mm. Well, Dad knew exactly what the story was when she said that. Sure. And he says, but... He says, well, uh, sister, um, I, I don't understand. Uh, I mean, what with you being the teacher, he's he is supposed to look at you, I, I think. If you were looking out the window, I could see you getting annoyed. But 
He looks at you. Isn't that what he's about? No, 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 it's not that. It's not that at all, Mr. Colombo. You don't understand. I know that when he's staring at me, he's looking at me with complete and utter contempt. <laughs> and my father said, oh, I can't believe that for a second, sister. My son Andre has nothing but the greatest respect for the habit, and he... <laughs> oh, that's right. You don't wear them anymore. <laughs> yeah, he got the message. She got well, the message. Well, I'll tell you what, sister. Here's the problem. Unless he shows you some outward sign of disrespect, I can't discipline him. And you, of all people, wouldn't want me to punish him for what he's thinking, I'm sure. So if I were you and I wanted his respect, I would try to earn it. Put the habit back on. But... He told us from that point on, he called the two of us together and said, boys, they're going to make your life hell from now on. <laughs> now, there's only two things to be done. We can either pull you out and put you in the public school, Selma Avenue, across the street, mm -hmm. and then you'll have a different set of issues, but you won't have those. They didn't say issues, they said problems. Nobody had issues in those days. They had problems, they had challenges. We didn't talk about issues. Anyway, so he says, I could do that. But if I do, of course, Sandra, you won't be graduating with your friends. In fact, you won't be graduating at all because that's not how that system works. You'd have another year there of ninth grade. Or you could stay. But if you stay, you'll be with your friends, but the dear sisters will make your lives miserable. And there's only so much I can do to help you. So there it is. And we looked at each other and said, we'll stay. Yep. And we did. We just have a couple minutes left, Charles. Give us a couple one-liners that your dad would give you regarding life experiences. I, I know you gave a couple to me last week. Well, of course, one of, one of my favorites. Go ahead. One of your favorites. We can get it in. One of my favorites was, you know, I can't make you do anything you don't want. All I can do is make you wish to God you had. Ah, very good. Well, we've been interviewing Charles Cologne about his father's life and how he affected the kids in a very positive way and i want to remind you i like the most important thing i heard was making parents let your kids know that they're the most important thing in their in your life so that they will see that in action thanks again for joining us here i, I make one more point if i can my father always said the is a thinking man for this. got it all right well thanks again for joining us charles and Yes. What state should we be living in, brother? We've got 30 seconds. Live in a state of sanctifying grace. Don't live in a state of mortal sin. And remember, Christ conquers, Christ reigns, Christ commands. Do not be afraid. Amen. And don't forget our lady said souls are going to hell because no one is there to pray and make sacrifices. Please pray and make sacrifices for the salvation of souls. May God richly bless you and your family. <laughs>